What's up YouTube? In today's video, we are going to learn how to exploit a buffer overflow inside a Windows application. So let's get to it. Login accepted. to get started we're going to need to download some tools and the first thing you're going to need to download is the immunity debugger or any debugger that you like to use so head on over to the uh, immunity website go to products go to immunity debugger and click the download link once you get there you'll have to fill out this form click download and you can install the debugger now, once you have the debugger installed, we're going to use a add-on for it called Mona. So go ahead and download this PI file right here. And once you have it downloaded, you're going to place it inside um, the folder named PI commands, depending on wherever you installed uh, immunity. By default, it's program files, immunity inc, immunity debugger, PI commands. And you can see that I have it installed right here. Perfect. Okay, now next we're going to need a compiler. And here we can download MGW for Windows, which gives us GCC support to create binaries for Windows. So go ahead and download and install that. And I have mine installed into the C, there we go, folder right here. And now before you're all said and done, you're going to need to add the bin directory to your Windows path. That way you can execute all the commands from any location. So let's go ahead and do that now. So go ahead and open up a command prompt. And then all you need to do is execute the following command. Now you'll replace dir, c colon backslash dir with whatever folder you installed into. So in my case, let's see, go back and just copy paste this. I would just copy this and paste it right here and hit enter and that will update my path. I've already did that so it's not necessary. So I'll show you. Oops. And you can see I have it installed right here. So now I can type GCC from any location and access all those tools so I can compile programs. All right, so with that out of the way, let's move on. All right, so the first thing we're going to need is a program in which we can overflow. So we need to write a exploitable program. So we're just going to write a simple C program that will contain a basic buffer overflow. Nothing fancy. So we're going to create a buffer and we'll give it, let's say 50 characters. Let's print something to the screen. Um, then we're going to use the gets function to um, take whatever input the user types and then store it into our variable. Now, the gets function is a vulnerable function because it does not do any bound checking. So if the user were to enter more than 50 characters, gets would allow this. Try to copy it to the buffer and it will overflow the buffer, which is exactly what we want. And finally, we'll just print the um, return to the user and finally we'll execute a pause command just this will just prevent our program from closing on us when uh, we're testing actually since we're doing it um, not through Visual Studio it's not really necessary uh, so we'll just get rid of that actually and there we go so this is our basic program basically we create a buffer of 50 bytes we ask the user for the name we get their input with the gets function 
we then print the results and then we close the program all right so let's go ahead and compile this and test it out so where okay on desktop so I'll just go to desktop and then we'll compile the code overflow.c dash overflow.exe all right there we go we can see our executable right here so let's go ahead and run it It's probably going to trip my antivirus. Let's give it a second. There we go. All right, so we'll just type in a name. And there you go. Hello, Hack Happy. All good and done. All right, now let's take a look and see what happens when we throw a bunch of X's at it and overflow the buffer. And you can see the program crashes. All right, so now it's time to fire up our debugger and take a look at what's going on. So if you haven't used Immunity Debugger before, don't worry, just follow along with me and just kind of see what I'm doing. Um, it's not really... You don't really need to know the nitty gritty right now. In a future video, I'll go over the debugger and kind of show you all about it and the things that you can do. Uh, but for now, just follow along. And to get started, we will open our program. And you can see everything gets loaded up. So up here, we're gonna use these buttons and this little play button will execute our program. So let's go ahead and click that. And when you do that, it runs our program down here in a window. Oh it twice and now we have our program so let's go ahead and throw a bunch of X's in it see what happens okay so something happened you can see immunity debugger stopped execution now if we get another stack here so this okay let me back up so here's our EIP value and this is what we want to gain control over. And as you can see, we have gained control over it because we have filled it, or replaced it rather, with 787878. And what is 78? Well, 78 is the decimal value of the letter X. And we just overflowed the buffer with a bunch of X's and we overwrit the EIP register. So, and you can see we also overflowed the EBP and down here you can see the stack and you can see what's going on now if you take notice you can see that um, right here we have this memory address and if you come up here that corresponds to the ESP um, so what we need to do so actually let me do this real quick so this is kind of what we have going on. So we filled our buffer with a bunch of X's, a whole bunch of junk bytes, all the way up to the EBP. So you can see the EBP is filled with 7H, which is X's. Continued on until we overwrit the EIP, which is X's. That's why it's 78's. And then we continue to overwrite with X's, which then filled the memory address after the EIP filled the memory address of where the ESP is pointing. So the ESP register is pointing to this next instruction. So when this is complete, it theoretically would then jump to this next memory address and continue execution. So what we want to do instead of filling this data with seven eights, which don't do anything, this is where our shell code payload will go. So let's go back. Junk bytes, we fill our junk bytes, we overwrite the EBP, then we want to overwrite the EIP, not with X's, but with an actual memory address 
to our shell code, which will be placed right here in this section of the buffer. Now, how do we know what memory address our shell code will be placed in? Well, we don't. And that's a problem because we need to change the EIP to point to the location of our shell code. That way it will run our shell code and we then have controlled the execution path. So what we need to do is find a method of pointing, or rather we need to find a method of getting our the execution to jump to our shell code. All right, so let me just kind of, before I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, so that's why I'm stumbling a little bit. I don't want to say too much just yet. So let's kind of take a few steps back and let's work up to that. All right, so now let's go ahead and let's introduce Mona. So let's get that started. All right, so we're going to use Mona and to do that, you just do exclamation mark forward slash Mona and that gives us access to the uh, script. And what we're going to do is we're going to first configure it. And this sets the working directory for Mona, because uh, Mona will create files and it needs to know where it wants to put it. So go ahead and run this command and you can place that wherever you like. I have already done so, so I don't need to do that. Um, actually, I'll just go ahead and do it so you can see what happens. So when you click it, you can see it's basically here just telling you what it did. So that's fine. You can go ahead and close that window. And now what we want to do <clears throat> is we want to find the offset. How many bytes do we need to overflow before we reach the EIP value? And so <clears throat> Mona has some cool tools for that. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a pattern, uh, create a pattern, and we're going to create a pattern of 100 bytes. So go ahead and execute the command. Mona did its magic. And you can see inside the Mona folder, oops, I messed up something here. I mean, it's fine, but it shouldn't be percent %s. What did I do? Uh, <clears throat> not percent %s, should be percent %p. So I'm going to go ahead and run that again. Perfect. Let me go back here, just delete this folder and show you what it's supposed to look like. All right. So now let's go ahead and run that pattern configuration again. This time let's go back to our Mona folder and you can see we have a folder with the name of the program we are currently debugging in Immunity. So open that and there is a pattern.txt file. Inside that file is the contents of our patterns. So we have an ASCII, hex, and JavaScript. So we're just simply going to copy that. And then we're going to go back to Immunity. So now we're going to restart the program. We'll go ahead and push play on it. And now we're going to paste in that pattern. Hit enter, our program will crash. And then we can go back to immunity. So we can see uh, the program has crashed. We have this new EIP value, 31634130. So go ahead and click on that, right click, and copy selection to clipboard. And once again, you can see ESP is pointing to the following memory address. And 4132643A is not a proper memory address, so that's why the program crashes. All right, so now what we're going to do is figure out the proper offset for our overflow. So the next command we're going to use is the pattern offset command. And you just simply type PO with the uh, memory address of the EIP value. So go ahead, hit enter on that. Mona will do its magic, and you can see we have a position of 62. So we're going to need 62 junk bytes um, for our exploit. So let's take note of that. All right. So great. So now we know how many um, 
bytes that will fill up to reach the EIP. So let's go back and look at our little thing. So we'll have 62 bytes. And then from here, from here, this is where we'll, we'll then overwrite the EIP with a new memory address that points to our shell code located here. And now we need to figure out how to point to our shell code since we won't know exactly which memory address it will be because it will be dynamically created we need to come up with another method well since this is a windows program it will load necessary dll files for it to properly operate uh, one of those dll files is the kernel 32 dll and inside there we may be able to find a jump to ESP, which this is assembly code, which just simply tells it to jump to the memory address located inside ESP. So if this were to execute at this time, it would go to ESP, read this memory address, and the execution flow would then jump down to this memory address and start executing. And that's exactly what we want because in this memory address will be the beginning of our shell code. So what we need to do is see if we can find a memory address inside the kernel 32 DLL with this instruction. And if we can find one, then we can just simply overwrite the EIP value right here with the memory address of the jump instruction in the kernel 32 DLL. That will then make it jump to our address which is located in the ESP register and then execute our payload. So really I should say payload. All right, so how do we find a jump instruction in the kernel 32 DLL? Well, Mona is great for that. So you can type this command to search for that instruction. So go ahead and just type that. Hit enter and give it a second and it will do its magic. All right, so let's minimize that, get to the log data window, you can see. And here we go. These are all the calls which will jump to the ESP um, register value. So all we need to do is go ahead and copy this address. You can see 74B21D19 is the address location to this jump ESP instruction inside the DLL. You can see it over here. It's kind of cut off kernel 32 DLL. All right. So now we have all the information we need to execute or write an exploit and hopefully exploit this overflow and execute some shell code. So let's start writing our exploit. All right, so we'll go ahead and just paste in that memory address. We'll need that in a second. Um, let's see, what are we gonna need? Um, well, since we're gonna do this in Python, of course, we're gonna need to execute the program. So we're gonna need to use popen, um, and we're going to create our payload. Now, first we need to fill it with junk bytes. So let's just go ahead and fill it with our 62 junk bytes. Remember 62 that we found earlier. So we'll just fill it with these junk bytes. Uh, next, what we need to do is we need to replace the EIP value with this memory address. So now, we're going to do that here. We need to do it in reverse order. So 19, 1D, um, B2, and 74. All right, and finally, we need our shell code. Basically, this will be the code that will be executed whenever 
our uh, program overflows a buffer, overwrites the EIP. That means the code will then jump to this address. That address is a jump to ESP, and the ESP memory address will now contain our payload, which will then be executed, and we, at that point, will have successfully exploited the overflow. So now I'm just going to paste in the shell code, and this shell code will um, execute calc.exe. So if all goes well, we should see the calculator automatically open after exploiting or executing the overflow attack. All right, so we have our payload complete, our junk bytes. This is the memory address to our jump ESP call, which is going to this will which this memory address will overwrite the EIP, which will then allow our shell code to get executed. So all we need to do now is run the program and then oops. Get that right. Yep. And then once we have that open, we then need to send our payload. And if all goes well at this point, our calculator will open. So this is a very bare bones basic exploit. So go ahead and save that. Go back to our command prompt. And go ahead and release the debugger, minimize that. And now let's go ahead and execute our exploit. And if all goes well, um, the calculator should open. So let's give it a shot. And there you have it. You can see that the program crashed because we um, overflowed everything and we were successfully able to um, execute our shell code and load the calculator. So that's it guys, that is how you take advantage and exploit a buffer overflow in a Windows application. Now we'll look at some more um, buffer overflows example for some more um, advanced applications, I guess for lack of a better word. And I'll also dive a little bit deeper into the immunity debugger and kind of breaking down buffer overflows. But for now, that's going to do it. If you like this video, please give me a thumb up. Do not forget to subscribe if you want to see new videos. And I will see you on the other side. Welcome, accepted.